Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, Mikla and I are going to talk a little bit about the project we just did in Venice called The Collectors. And this talk is called Curating the Collectors. Um, some of you have been there. I recognize some people, some faces. Um, but maybe this talk can give you a little bit more information about the different things we do show there. Um, in Venice, we had the opportunity to play both in the Danish pavilion and the Nordic pavilion, two neighboring pavilions. And um, in those two pavilions, we crea created two collectors' homes, two very, very different looking homes. The idea come, came from when we went to Venice and looked at the Nordic pavilion, which is made by an architect, uh, Svea Fein, and a very beautiful pavilion very difficult to make a show in, but would create a lovely living space. So we went home and thought, well, it would be nice to move there, but um, to make the show, hmm. And then, well, let's make a home. After a little while, we also got commissioned to do the Danish pavilion, and it was logic to make a neighbor the Giardini in itself is like a neighborhood where you have the different nationalities, like a very international neighborhood, and everyone there tries to grow the biggest pumpkin in their garden in order to win the prize. So um, we were like, why not making this story about two neighbors two different living modes, two different ways of collecting. So we start here in front of the, the Danish pavilion. We'll take you on a tour through the two pavilions or to the, through the two homes. Um, as you see here, there's a for sale sign in front of the Danish pavilion. Um, the bidding price started on 10 million euros, I think, and you would be led through the spaces by this couple, this lovely couple from England, two real estate agents that um, presented the home to the audience. Um, as you see, there was not everything that was as easy to sell. I mean, there were some broken stairs, there were slanting floors, um, you know, there were some water ru running down and into the spaces. Um, we're, what we see here is the library area where we, um, of course, had a collection of books, partly on the subject of collecting. Um, you couldn't access the maybe most valuable book, the ones that people really wanted to see. It's in the line of denials that Mikkel and I have been working quite a lot with in our works. Um, there's also a collection of photographs here on the coffee table um, by the Norwegian artist Tora Dolven Balke that went into a collaboration with us and created um, these wonderful photos, both from Venice and from the these fictive families' um, life. Since Inga and I are relatively lazy artists, we are already a duo because we just want to do half the work. And now we had two venues, so we invited 23 colleagues to help us filling up these pavilions with different artworks that would be the collections. Um, if you go to the right, when you enter the pavilion, you enter the, the dining room. Uh, not everything you see in this pavilion is what you think it is by the first, um, for first watching it. Um, for instance, these golden frames um, are um, framing beggar signs um, collected by the artist Jan Elenonen from Finland. Um, so you have a kind of rather sad contrast to this pompous uh, dining situation. And also the furniture has kind of collapsed. The dining table itself is broken in the middle. Um, it's called Table for Bergman. The rumor says that 
the family divorced. Some do that in a more ungraceful way as others. So they had to split the dining table with a hand-painted Meissner porcelain. In the background here we have two Stella paintings. Stella Arbeit macht frei and Stella die Fahne hoch. Um, they are of course not by Stella but by Sturtevant who has remade them. And to the left we see a work by um, Nina Saunders, a Danish artist who works with different kind of designs and collapses um, their features. Inga and I like copiers, therefore we also, of course, invited Stuart Evang. The good thing about a copy is that, like, it even adds an extra layer to the original. You have often a long time to rethink the work, so the copy might appear to be even more fun than the original sometimes. Here we have a multiple collaboration between us, James Franco's voice inside the Brent Cousy sculpture, and Mauricio Catalan, who made the family dog. And that kind of creates a new version of his master's voice. It was a relatively bizarre family who inhabited this house. Um, this image is from the family's TV room. Um, Laura Horelli, the Finnish artist, created the work especially for this exhibition as well, using footage of her mom, who used to be a uh, um, TV hostess. She made cooking programs for children, and the mother died um, in the 80s, so Laura mostly know her through this TV program. And um, that was quite characteristic for the exhibition that there were a lot of like um, humoristic works in it there were a lot of uh, entertaining uh, takes in the exhibition but for those who had an eye for the finer details there were also a lot of serious statements in the exhibition like Laura's work that was very very touching and very personal and in the Nordic Pavilion, we come to works there as well that have a really profound depth to them. Mm. Yeah, the different artists we work with was represented in various ways. I mean, so were, some were represented with existing works and other made site-specific work or um, work that sort of was their take on the, on the subject. This is not really a work. This is um, gallerist Massimo De Carlo's wonderful uh, porcelain collection. Maybe this is a side to Massimo De Carlo that not many people know. Um, it's Weimar porcelain collected in various markets around. Well, one of the things we wanted to stress with this exhibition entitled The Collectors is that there's so much more to collecting than investment and art market and auction prices and then throughout the last decade it has all been about that but like the truth is that all of us who have passions and obsessions and collect it's because we are little knots and um, people collect all kind of things not only contemporary art they collect uh, brief marks shoelaces uh, Weimar porcelain, used swimwear, uh, memories, all kind of stuff. And there's so many uh, social cultural layers, there's so many historical layers, there's so many psychological reasons for collecting. So it's like a big mystery. And it's a bit sad that all talk about collecting in recent years have turned into this kind of art market talk, which is just such a little part of it. Collecting is, of course, in a way, a way of staging oneself. And that's also what we're doing within this double show, staging a collection. Um, 
here you see a work by Martin Jacobsen, a young Swedish artist, where the collector has sort of become what his collection is. The collection admiring his own, the collector admiring his own um, hoarded work. We didn't only show um, sort of very valuable thing as, as you see here, it's uh, a collection of flies. I'm sorry that the image is not very sharp, but it's from a biologist and writer in Sweden who actually managed to write a best-selling book on fly collecting, which I think is a, quite an achievement in itself. <laughs> and this is the last image we're going to show from the Danish pavilion. It's Clara Lidane's teenage room, especially made for this exhibition. You can see the flap in the wall where the teenager probably escaped at night. Um, the work also include a collection, actually the sort of Danish canon for what everyone has to go through in school of music, literature and film. Well, I said earlier that the flies were very small. This was also a real piece by, um, by Massimo Bartolini, the pearl that is only shown to the person that the guard wants to show it to. After yeah. people had a tour by the real estate agents through the Danish pavilion, uh, they were led on their own into the Nordic pavilion, the neighbor who was a mysterious Mr. B. Um, quite a different lifestyle, quite a different architecture. Um, the pavilion almost looks like a case study house from mid last century and could have been located in LA instead of uh, at the Giardini. And that was our starting point. So in front of the Nordic Pavilion, you see a work from um, Jonathan Monk, Giant Spinning O, um, the circle around the perfect man. It has the size of the artist himself, 182 centimeters. It was quite fun where the Norwegian queen actually jumped through the hoop for the opening. <laughs> and all the guys, like, the guys said, wow, she's jumping through a giant cock ring. Isn't it? <laughs> Here we see the Nordic Pavilion from the from another perspective, just an overview. Of course, an inspiration for that pavilion, if Hitchcock had been a bit of an inspiration in the Danish pavilion, was David Hockney. Um, David Hockney is often considered quite kitsch, but he also had a big influence on giving out a positive image of gay life. And of course, it has been important with a lot of uh, more serious and more uh, kind of uh, serious topics connecting to gay identity, such as age or uh, gay bashing. But it's also been uh, very important to have some more cheerful statements. And David Hockney has been the deliverer of that. So we can move inside. I mean, of course, in the Nordic Pavilion, Mr. B's collection of art and artifacts is a collection that kind of constitutes his identity and his sexuality as we picture it. Um, this is again an overview where you see Vibikus Lyngstad's painting in the background. You see on the right hand side. Um, two Polynesian sculptures next to Wolfgang Tillmann's um, photography of three nudists in Berlin. Um, it is a very queer collection you see here, but we also wanted to show how different people actually work with the subject of sexuality or maybe here more specifically homosexuality. Um, on the left hand side you see Henrik Olesen's take on Solovitz cubes. They are made of styrofoam, um, very fragile. And according to the artist, it's also sort of a, uh, a, a dealing with the father figures, um, both in life and within art. 
Um, another more conceptual piece is by Simon Fujiwara that copied the structure of the pavilion itself and made it into a writing table. And an erotic story unfolds on top of the table, drawing on the architecture itself and architectural history. What we, did, what we did in the pavilion was like to build in all these platforms and the transparent bathroom. It's a very exhibitionistic architecture in the pavilion. And therefore, we also prefer to use the term not curating, but staging. What we did was playing the interior designers for giving the other artists a different environment to show their art within. Mm. Of course, this kind of architecture does reflect a different lifestyle that maybe was more experimental mid-last century. It's a lot, there's a lot of elements taken from Sarinen and Eames collaboration. Um, but it also reflects the lifestyle where you don't have to divide your flats into spaces that are sort of, you know, closing each family member off from each other or certain activities have to happen in certain spaces. It's much more fluid in that sense. Um, in the background here, you see a work by Han and him. Um, you mentioned collecting used swimwear. Um, I guess the title of the work is Butterflies. Um, here you see the receding seating area. And again, Vibeke Slyngstad's paintings. Um, and if you have a closer look at them, you will recognize the architectural elements from the pavilion itself. She also collaborated with us. And I guess it's a quite unusual collaboration for, uh, for a painter. Um, she is, in her work, very interested in architecture and design and has always used interiors as a basis for her paintings. But we were super happy that she, you know, collaborated in this way. And of course, she added a lot of her own drama to it. And one can maybe also see this um, painting to the left, I guess that is, yeah, as a portrait of the collector living there, headless. We wanted to do a show on queer topics within the biennial. And to do that, we absolutely needed heterosexual artists also, like Jonathan Monk or Vibeke Slyngstad or Guillaume B, who made a small bird's nest with two uh, white pool balls and a red one. And suddenly you can see that works that are not intended working with sexual identity can be read in a different way if the setting has changed and the context is like a different one than a normal museum setting. Mm. Um, another artist that have used sort of a maybe heterosexual language, but um, uh, but adds another kind of depth to it uh, is um, the artist Pepe Espaliu, a Spanish artist who died in the beginning of night. This it's his uh, maybe rather formal looking sculpture that you see here on the right side, the black one. Um, it's one of his carrying pieces. It's probably one of the saddest pieces in this part because it was work, the work he did uh, before he died, uh, very sick from AIDS. He could hardly walk anymore and he was carried on these sculptures by his artist, um, scul uh, artist colleagues, politicians, celebrities, I guess. And we're very happy to have included this in the, in the exhibition. Um, here we go on to something rather more explicit. It's uh, Tom of Finland, who has been quite overseen in the more established part of the art world, but we have lived with his images um, throughout our lives in dirty bars around the world. Um, many of them are called Tom's Bar, named after the artist. Um, fantastic drawings. Um, there's not so much more to say about them, other than that they are rather well hung. His name was very good for like being national uh, representing 
a country like some of Finland it's already in the name. Mm. Many people don't actually know that he is from Finland and he did spend most of his life there, actually, uh, not California as people think. Um, you maybe noticed uh, Tomo Finland's David sculpture, uh, David's uh, drawing on the right hand side just before and in the background here we have um, Terence Coe's two David sculptures um, facing each other uh, who have next been to the bed. Who have been provided in large genitals. Yeah, exactly. They're missing other limbs, but the genitals are very intact. Um, this piece is also shown next to the bed, maybe suitably so. It's from uh, William E. Jones, um, American artist based in Los Angeles. He used to work for Larry Flint for a few years, and he collected a lot of material for his artworks. P gay porn movies, mostly from 60s till the 80s. Um, but he does cut out most of the actual sex scenes and create sort of other social commentary uh, with this material. People had to go to bed in order to see his work. And that also shows that uh, we had very close collaborations with all the participating artists who were all really sweethearts and wanted to play along and state their works in a different way. Uh, so uh, William was totally okay with like having the audience lying in the bed. What we also had was like young men as guards in the pavilion. So sometimes you had to lie next to a young guy in white t-shirt and faded jeans and watch William's videos. Once again, an overview, but um, on the left-hand side, you also have um, Hernan Bass, um, painter from Miami, also a gay artist, but again, with a very different approach than, say, Vibikus Lyngstad or um, many of the other artists included. Um, there were some hidden little collections around, like um, this collection of um, contemporary classic music in the stove, inspired well, by one of our dear friends in New York, uh, Norman Frisch, uh, the, the theater director, who Let's basically used his kitchen as a storage room. Never cooked an egg. Never cooked an egg in his life. Um, we also actually commissioned a musical piece for the exhibition by uh, the young composer Nico Muli. Um, you might know his music from The Reader, um, the, the, the film The Reader, or maybe even from the opera itself. Uh, he also wrote, writes for the opera in Paris or the, the Metropolitan. Um, but he created a fantastic piece for the exhibition dealing with the space and let himself be inspired by the other, other artists included. Um, again, Wolfgang and the Polynesian sculptures, and um, Tom of Finnmark. Tom uh, comes from Finnmark in northern Norway, and he came down, came down to be a sort of perform performative element um, at the opening days. Outside you see the pool with the mysterious Mr. B floating with his face down. He had a quite wild lifestyle. Sometimes then these things happen. Um, the work is called Death of a Collector, inspired by Paul Zeck, Death of a Hippie, a work that we always love. Um, how are we with time? <laughs> five, ten minutes left? You have five minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is our piece, yeah. We kind of just filled in all the holes where the other artists didn't want to do something. Then we were like, okay, we come up with something then.
did you get to sell the pavilions? Did you get any good offers? Uh, um, I think there were interests, but um, yeah, we have to talk to the real estate brokers. Here we, it went. We, we certainly didn't want to sell the Nordic pavilion because it's so pretty. The Danish pavilion is less fortunate. It's kind of a mixture of uh, shabby uh, neoclassicistic nuclear and some functionalistic yellow brick stone outside. So we count on selling that one. Hi. Um, when I was uh, walking in the pavilions, and especially in the Nordic one, because I'm from Sweden, and what I saw was really like um, a lot of historical references to the Swedish welfare system and uh, the whole uh, 20th century history or the history in, in Sweden and Scandinavia after 45 and in a way how it actually collapses and what happens when in a certain sense when everything gets to be too good maybe uh, and I noticed of course that I mean the collector he's not like a, he's writing porno pulp fictions and it's kind of empty the whole thing and I thought it was interesting also because you mentioned that in within the collector or within the pavilion you have a lot of more in-depth artworks and that actually are very serious because when I spoke to colleagues all around the topic uh, from everyone was mostly about the shallowness and that it was empty but they didn't have this crit critical overview and I would like to know a bit more about that. Um, we did a show a couple of years ago at the Serpentine Gallery in London and in uh, Bergen Kunsthalle also called the welfare show uh, so it's not totally irrelevant in in this context to to refer to that and of course we grew up in welfare states and saw them collapse collapsing as such um, symptomatic for for the audience in the pavilions I think have been that many have actually added to the stories like to the narratives in the pavilions and making a show with a lot of fellow artists in a setting like uh, the Venice Biennial that is so busy and where a lot of people uh, just go and rush through we wanted to do environments where it was possible to get an experience just by rushing through because that's the reality that we deal with but where it would also be possible to sit and uh, contemplate for a long time and go into details like read in the books watch the videos and the fu their full lengths and so ever I think it's like you have to adjust your exhibitions to the context uh, in which you show them. There's a big difference of doing a show in a small Kunsthalle in a German city where you will have a very small audience and where you can more maybe just speak to your colleagues about professional issues and it functions as a laboratory and that can be a big satisfaction. And then actually uh, not being ignorant to the big audience who pay their tickets at an event like the Venice Biennial, but actually make something that might be understandable and accessible for a bigger crowd without being populistic. Like, it has been also in recent times, maybe uh, a bit easy to, uh, a bit too easy to to knack on all the big art events like the biennials and say oh they're just like too spectacular and they're too superficial and whatsoever they have generated an interest in contemporary art that also means that like maybe smaller and more focused events have got 
much more attention and much better funding. And I have met most of my friends in uh, situations where we were invited to participate in a biennial. So I, I, I think it's too easy just to say, oh, these biennials are so bad or they are so uh, um, <coughs> empty out all the seriousness uh, about art. I think it's about how you approach it yourself for a big part. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, right here. Um, I, I saw this, uh, this piece uh, in the Biennale just a few days back, and you're right, you do have to um, experience it, you have to experience the space, um, especially in a Biennale where you have to really rush through everything and try and catch as much as you can. Um, it was great to just sit and chill um, in this uh, architectural space and be a part of uh, your art. Um, what I want to ask is, were you privy to uh, the uh, reactions of your audience? Because this particular piece, um, it was quite interesting to watch people walk by, stop, <laughs> you know, smirk, or just, you know, walk along. Or um, uh, quite a few people actually sat on those staircases to sit and contemplate on who is this guy and why does Maurizio Catalan keep doing work like this? <laughs> Uh, it's, not so, it's not so strange that people feel at home when you make homes. That was not such a big surprise. Um, and uh, all we wanted was to tell these two stories about two eccentric collectors in each their way, and then let the stories unfold in people's head in each their way. I have all my life been very much against being told truths by everyone, like school teachers and authorities or fellow artists. I don't think it's very good to give people bad consciousness. That's not a good starting point. Um, so happy that we just created something where people actually could interact with it in, in various ways from their lives. We are all very different and we all have very different desires and approaches to the art experience. And that's the beauty of that, I think. Can I just ask a question about the goodie bag that's sitting down there? Yeah, I was and just going to mention that. Yeah. It's, a, it's sort of an extension. The catalogue became a kind of extension of the show itself because, as you mentioned, it's, you know, you, the theoretical side or the critical side is somehow sometimes hard to include in a, in a, sh in a show because you can't say everything, obviously. And I think we came around quite a few issues and subjects in the show itself. Um, so, but we decided to invite some academics to write, academics and writers to contribute pieces to as what you call the goodie bag, <laughs> the bagalogue, as it also has been called. Um, and they are, you know, they deal with different subjects, like, you know, how you collect things without means or if you have like extreme sort of capital to uh, to collect with or um, also other issues around sort of historical archiving and subjects related to collecting. Um, in general, like the bag is full of contributions from the artists, like there's little objects and text pieces and printed matter um, that we asked the, the artists to to do because we found it a little bit sort of boring to again do another catalog where we see reproductions of old work and another CV and where people are born and um, yeah we wanted to go beyond that and even the writers um, agreed to make their their texts into some sort of object that added to their um, their pieces yeah of a course. Bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's like a, a collection of very dedicated junk. Uh, 
Um, but you have a calendar. It's not really going from January to December, but like it's functional in some way, so you can hang it in your kitchen. Um, no, like we, rather than doing a catalog that would be like explaining the project, we wanted to add to this kind of mm, twisted reality that we staged uh, with these two pavilions. And in general, in our production, we have been very fond of like just presenting twisted realities to look at reality in a new way because it's so difficult to actually uh, perceive it in everyday life because there's so much of it. And if you kind of show it in a densed up little twisted obscure way, you might think about certain issues from the reality. And bigger ambitions, we don't have them. Hi. Um, do we have to stop there? Or? One, mo one more question, okay. Hi, I just have a question for the two of you as two artists and collaborators. How do you conceive a project like this working together when you come up with any challenges if one of you says, I think this, and the other one says, I think that? How do you come to a, a, an agreement on what you're going to go, and how do you go f further with your ideas? Well, we, we try to not make, not make any compromises. So if, you know, we don't force the other to agree on anything. If, the other, if one of us don't agree, we just move forward, find we, something else. We have been work, working together for 15 years, so you kind of morph into being this two-headed monster. Um, it's striking how similar ideas we get today. Um, it helped a bit, we split up five years ago. We were also like partners in private before. Now it's a bit better. We get a bit of inspiration from elsewhere. So. Yeah, thanks a lot for Thank coming. You.